from uh, Invisalign that uh, since plastic is a bit softer, it's softer than metal, rubber bands are really fundamental to control the rolling effects and uh, to control all the side effects that you might have if you want to close the interaction. Another thing, during space closure, don't forget your orthodontics. You have, you need to control your curve of Wilson, you need to control the curve of space, and when you're closing your, um, your spaces, you still need to add, the, some authors say, one millimeter of intrusion every, 0 0.1 millimeter of intrusion every one millimeter of refraction. It means control your interior torque, Control your lateral torque. This is very well described by my friend Jay Bowman. Okay, this is I recommend you to go to uh, to the website of the JCO and and download this three uh, this article written in three parts. They are really amazing. It's really three amazing articles. Other thing that I would do uh, would be let's say. Okay, so this is, if you think of it, it's nothing really new because you have, uh, even when you have braces, some tough movements, you always try to overcorrect with your braces or bending the wire. This is pretty much the same. I'm going to go back to the video so you have to see it. Um, every time you want to close an extraction space, move the roots first, okay, because you're it's basic, basic biomechanics. You're actually pushing on the crown. You're having maybe the good um, attachment, but you're gonna create a momentum, and your crown is not gonna is, is gonna move more than your roots. So if you want to ask your technician to uh, manufacture a clean check uh, for an extraction clay case, just you can ask him move the root first. It's like we're if we were applying actually uh, gable back. Nothing new, again, I can show you that it's nothing new. Let me see. Okay. Uh, Randall Womack. Uh, I think you all know him. He was, uh, he's a teacher in uh, Art Studio Dugoni in uh, San Francisco, and he wrote this in 2006. Okay. He did the four promoter extraction case with Invisalign in 2006. In 2006, Invisalign didn't have smart track, doesn't have the, all the uh, tweaks that we currently have. He didn't have anything. And But just thinking and using his brain, he, he, he made it to, he realized a beautiful case with four promoter extractions. I recommend you to read this article. It's really amazing. And it stresses again that Overcorrect your clean check. Your clean check is only a system force. It's not the final, um, the final setup. This is another thing. Another chapter: extractions and aligners. What we have, we have buttons and attachments. Uh, one of the masters uh, one of, uh, is Dr. Jima and Dr. Shu. Um, they both wrote this uh, articles with other authors. Um, but you really need to keep in mind, uh, we can't go through everything, but what you really need to keep in mind is that you, you need to have as many, let's say, uh, button cut out as you, as you can, because remember, uh, if you're doing the same case with braces, uh, you can just hook a power chain or a rubber band, whatever you want. But here it's an indirect system. So if you think that one tooth is going to have issues moving into an extraction space or it needs maybe some more force, just go forward and think, yes, I'm going to put the button cut out. And if you can see on this, um, on this slide, you can see that for every button cut out that I have, I also have an attachment. And I'm going to shortly uh, tell you why. You can see here it's a clinical picture. Um, they look like class two elastics, but then on some time, you know, from lower six to upper three, but then at some moment I needed to lose some anchorage, so I decided to swap and to go for class three elastics. Maybe 
you know, pretty much the same thing that you would do without even thinking, um, but you would, you would do with uh, your, uh, your, your braces. So again, the logic is pretty much the same. You have some uh, slight features that might differ, but mainly orthodontics is the same. Oh, yeah. Why do we need to put attachments every time we have a button cut out? We need to prevent the rotation because if we start by pulling on the button cut out, uh, we're going to have um, a rotation. The tooth is going to rotate into the aligner, so we're going to have a misfit. Uh, we're going to create a couple of force. So, for example, we have the attachment, a couple of force, and we have the attachment, and we have the button cut out. And these two forces are going to help tipping the root. Okay. Other thing is you need to um, remember that we sorry work. Uh, the button cutout, since we're going to put it on the most incisal part of the tooth, is the hardest part of the plastic. So the plastic is going to pop in and the liner is going to fit perfect. Let's see, we're having some issues, but all right. So again, we don't have rotation. We prevent the rotation of the teeth. This is me. I think it's going to help you a bit more. When you have a class two elastics, for example, your arch is going to twist in this way. And if not all the arch, those the upper tree and the lower six are going to twist. Lower six is going to twist visually, and the upper tree is going to twist, it's going to rotate distally. What can we do to prevent this? Add an attachment. And if it's not enough, overcorrect your final setup. I mean, the upper tree, you might mesial, add like, like 10, 15 degrees of mesial rotation, and uh, the lower six, 10, 15 degrees of this rotation. What about a mechanics with stretch? Well, pretty easy. Uh, I guess someone is laughing about me or about this line, but Actually, what you can see is Invisalign has been doing, uh, instead of continuous mechanics, has been doing segmented mechanics since the very beginning. Why so? Because segmented mechanics, you have more control. Okay, you have much more control. So they will, they will be doing this with, uh, you know, when we're distalizing and now we can use it for, we can think about it now about distalization and extractions and intrusion. Now we're just going to have a look at what we call the segmented mechanic for uh, distalization, for uh, space closure. Let's see how it goes. All right. This is how it looks. I hope every one of you. Uh, takes a look to this um, slide every time you manufacture your clean check. This tells you what tooth will be moving at what time and what aligner. Uh, with this kind of mechanic, the principle is that some teeth don't move and some other teeth move. Okay? In this way, we can be as much effective as we want and we can have as much control as we want. You can, you can imagine that if we have a complex movement and every single tooth from seven to seven is moving, correcting teeth torque and rotation, the plastic, of course, is going to uh, adapt, is going to adapt itself to this uh, movement, but we're going to lose track. We're going to have a misfit. We're not going to have the full expression of the movement or the force that we want. So, this article from these two um, Australian colleagues was written in 2014. So again, one year after um, the smart track. And you can see that, um, I'm gonna go back with the video, okay. And you can see that some teeth are moving while others are not moving. Um, this is, the re this is the principle of frog, me frog mechanic, frog staging, stagger, however you want to call it. So I have an extraction space. I want to close it. There are difficult movements. 
what do I do? I first concentrate for eight aligners on some movement. Then I stop everything else. I use the teeth that I've just used as anchorage and I start by moving the rest, okay? This is why it's called frog because you do one, then jump to the other, other uh, group of teeth then you jump again to another group, okay? So let me go to the next slide and I think it will be, will be much easier. So you define eight, uh, you define your, your um, eight aligner. So every, for example, from one to eight aligner, you move, uh, I don't know, canines back and premolars forward when you have, for example, premolar extraction. So you move them only for two millimeters. Every single aligner move a tooth in those kind of movement for 0 0.25 millimeters. So we're going to have for eight aligners, I mean, two millimeters, you have, you have uh, canines, for example, when you, uh, let's, uh, let's think about the case when you remove like 14, you extract 14 and, and um, 14 and 24. You have canines going backward. The first premolar was a bit going forward and you start by closing the space. Then you, you stop everything. You let a bit of time to recover and then uh, you move, for example, incisors. So the principle is just you segment your mechanic, you have um, full control of your movement, your teeth are gonna perfectly fit into your aligners, uh, you're gonna have less side effects, and maybe you're gonna have even less refinement. Again, tooth recovery, we press the plastic that forms, then since it's not moving for the next eight aligners, the plastic has a time to bring, to hold the crown, and so the, the, the root can tilt towards the movement that we want. The other advantage is that with frog staging is that we can have small attachments. I don't know if you've noticed that um, for example, Kenji Ujima has very small attachments uh, that might go against some the logic that we might, we might have studied, like we need to have the biggest surface possible to have a force uh, on it, and so the tooth can move according to this big surface. It's, it's not, it, it's true, but when you have so short and controlled movement, your attachments are mainly a way to hold everything in place, okay? Because you, you have um, managed everything perfectly, your movement are perfectly under control, and you don't really need, you don't really need to have other, uh, to be worried about other side effects. See, other thing, frog stage, when we're closing in, again, we don't have a mass retraction because it would, since we don't have intercostation, as we said before, uh, we might lose too much anchorage. So one of the things that we that we do is when we're decided about where we're on, close the spaces, we just start the moving canines, then incisors, canines, then incisors, canines, then incisors. This is the only this is one of the only ways that was even mentioned by first, like in the 50s, uh, saying that um, when you have this kind of uh, retraction, you need a lot less anchorage. Again, I'm a big fan of movies, sorry, and Netflix. So let's wrap it up. Movements are better control. We can change a liner faster. This is still a controversial topic, but it's kind of logic. You, are, you have everything under control. It means that you might you, your teeth are gonna go ex pretty much exactly where you want it to go. And you need less refinements, why, why so? Because you might, uh, you might want to, you need less detailing because you have less side effects. Let's have a, let's see a case, for example. This is Jonathan, okay, has, I decided mm, to extract upper fours, okay, you had big teeth, you had this uh, misshaped teeth, and it still 
any wanted to have a, a nice, a wonderful smile. Okay, so we decided to go for upper four extractions, lower IPR, and in this line, why not? You can have the uh, OPG and the lat lateral staff, the right. And as you can see, this is, I'm sorry for the quality of the pictures because when I started this case, I was working for a corporate and they didn't want to invest in the lateral mirrors and mirrors in general. So you will see pictures are gonna improve with, uh, with the case. This is what I did. Extractions, I kept everything in the upper back on hold. As you can see, look at the two upper uh, pictures, for example, upper left and upper right. <laughs> you can see that canines are going backward, keep holding the root, this though, uh, and I'm using those uh, attachments on the upper six and seven that maybe some, may, many of you know, uh, they're called yin yang attachments invented by um, Jonathan Nikazizis, the US great practitioner. Uh, the mistake that I can see here is that I used, um, as you can see in the lower left um, video image, I can see, uh, you can see the semi -pantic. Okay, this means that I had a good result, but I didn't have full control of my hatch of my tooth. Another thing that you might notice is that I had, I have big attachments. Okay, big attachments mean that I'm some difficult movement uh, attachments really help me out to control the root of the move of the teeth. Let's see how I ended. This is after the first, I think, 35, 36 aligners. As you can see in the upper left image, um, I have pretty much the, 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 the space is closing in. I'm still having a bit of issues on the upper five, but the lower arch is quite well reshaped and we're starting to have a U form. U, the, 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 my, uh, my arches look like uh, a U and less than V. There's no crowding anymore. And your his upper canines are going pretty well, okay? Uh, he wanted to have a nicer smile, so we had upper incisors, the 211 and 21 we built up, okay? So that's why you're gonna see this in the next, in the next slide. Okay. This is clean check number two. Change the different strategy. Still put some IPR. I'm going to tell you at the end of this case why I do so much IPR. Uh, but now let's focus on uh, the way I manage the canines, premolars, and upper molars. Okay. Maybe it's going to be a bit easier if we go this way. As you can see, I started by retracting the canines, changing the tip because they, they had huge positive um, crown teeth. Okay, and then I decided to lose a bit of anchorage. Okay, as you can see, uh, it's gonna be, I had yin yang attachment on the upper six bilateral. I managed my canine, anything, nothing else is, is moving, is moving. Look at this. Until now, I haven't moved anything else, just the canine, because I wanted to have the canine right in place. Then I started by moving sizers. I'm sorry. Go again. First the liners, I even more than eight. Well, but this is I just moved the canines, then I started by moving the, the incisors, and then I changed my I changed my um, attachments. I don't know if someone noticed that from, let's see, from this, from the yin yang to a conventional attachment because I wanted to lose anchorage. That's what I told you before. I decided to adapt my case and lose a bit of posterior anchorage. Look from this to this, okay? Nothing else is moving. Pretty much, I think that's moving. Now I know that I need some um, some uh, class three elastics. As you can see, all the blue lines uh, mean that I have a button there. Okay, so I've been doing this. I 
try to control B up for five, and then I'm closing. So this is after clean check number two. As you can see, spaces are almost closed. Uh, we still have some minor gaps in the front. Uh, our shapes are very nice. They're coordinated. Uh, you can see the lower, the left side is nice. Okay, so we have tip on the on the upper five that I need to better control. I think it was my mistake while I was uh, tweaking the um, screen check, but pretty much it's a done case. I don't have much else to do. You can see on the right side, we still have a bit of open bite. This is just <coughs> the control of the lateral torque. I was talking about the curve of Wilson, and this is what really happens. My, I need to, need to better control my curve of Wilson. So, again, I went with uh, another clean check. You need to think that uh, regardless of the number of refinements you, you, you might ask, uh, you visually might do, what you really have to keep in mind is the average duration of a treatment, okay, and of course the price estimate, but the average duration of the treatment, it's really important. Uh, because this, there's no evidence that, that in this line it's quicker than other techniques, okay? Uh, the biology is pretty much the same. The, so if you need, for example, 30, 40 aligners to do some movements, you might need more aligners to do other movements, but it's gonna last pretty much the same um, amount of months that it would last with conventional braces. Let's say upper force extraction, in my, according to what I've researched on the JCO, this is a journal that I love, it's pretty much 18 to 20 months, okay? So there's no reason that it's gonna last less than 20, than 18 months. So we have this one, and this is what we have. This is what we have. We have the, uh, the one of the fine, I think it's gonna be the fine of team check. And one of the things that are important is that I'm, okay, by the end around the line of 25, I'm having the uh, 25, and around 25 I'm having a lot of IPR. This is not a real IPR, okay? This is just a way to keep the torque and to close all the remaining spaces. It's like putting, putting a power chain. I don't really have the way, uh, the time to tell you uh, how I manage those tiny gaps, but this is one of the ways uh, I manage the remaining gaps, whether it's after IPR or after um, or after extraction spaces. So you can see here by the end, 25th, boom, all the IPR at the same time. You can see there are a lot, even dispute or a lot of button cutouts because it would be pretty much exactly what you would be doing with braces. You know, when you have up and down elastics, you would do pretty much the same thing. You know that you need to avoid um, collisions with um, with uh, attachments. That's why I might see a bit more often those patients. I might grind off those attachments. You might see on the right and left sides where uh, we think that um, um, teeth are hitting on the teeth are eating on the, the attachments. But pretty much is what you would be doing with with. Uh, uh, up and down elastics. There's nothing really new. The only difficult part is that you need to think it through before approving a clean check. Because doing this, even if you have you know the J bone pliers to cut this button, it's not going to be as effective. Okay. This is one of the last consults that I uh, really wanted to ask my patients to come to my practice, but here in Switzerland. So what? So I sent, I forward him one of the videos of my American friend, uh, Kyle Fagala, and there was a very nice tutorial uh, that taught him how to take pictures, and I think uh, his uh, girlfriend helped him out. Okay, so this is what we can have. This is what I got yesterday. Uh, of course, they're not perfect. 
but you can already see a couple of things. Uh, molars, they're pretty well interpospated. I still have a bit of issues with the four, upper five, sorry, but uh, it still has like six, seven aligners to go. Midline's centered. Uh, this is the best I can do with, uh, with the coronavirus. So uh, next time I'll be seeing him, I will see if I just need to stabilize his occlusion and maybe and maybe uh, add 15 new aligners. But compared to the very beginning, it's an incredible, it's an incredible result. What about the second topic of this uh, webinar? Has. Why mini screws? Why mini screws are so important in a, uh, with aligners? Well, you don't, as I mentioned at the very first slide, you don't have to forget that you don't have interface You don't have it. Okay? So you might need a bit more, a little bit of help that you might not be need if you were using uh, braces. Uh, this was very well written by my friend Jay Bowman. Um, you wrote this one about um, effectiveness and combination of alignments as crews are to consider because of the anchorage concern during orthodontic treatment with aligners. Don't forget that one of the ways to use them is use the screws and aligners might be to use them as a direct anchorage. So as I mentioned before, pads might be very useful, maybe a bit more useful with aligners than with braces, but um, you also need to think how we can use those pads for our advantage. One of the ways to use them is as a direct anchor. And I'm trying to avoid a side effects compared to this guy just fell into the water. Let's see. Uh, this is uh, 2.12 millimeters Chris Chang mini screws. Direct anchorage, I have pretty much everything I mentioned here so far. Button on the third, on the on the tree, nose pontic or semi-pontic between three and five. An additional button on the on the six because I didn't know if I might need it. Screws, rubber bands that go straight to um, the tree. So uh, in this case, doesn't matter what it is, but what you need to keep in mind is that in this case, I really need to keep my anchorage. I don't want to have anything lost. Okay, this is the case. It's a tree extraction, three premolars extractions. And as you can see, when you need to hold your anchorage, if you might manage it with braces, just with rubber bands, with liners, it's gonna be a hell or a lot difficult, more difficult. So keep in mind, if you need to put a screw, I'm not, not saying abuse, abuse of them, but just add, put a screw and, make, and better control your anchor. Same thing here, the Sony took straight, took that form four, you can see straight from the screw, the screws are out of the of the alveolar bone, so the teeth can move, but even but here it wouldn't need to be, we need them to be out of the alveolar bone because I just want to have full attraction, full attraction. In the lower right picture, on the other hand, you can see that I'm using a class one elastic. Uh, I might replace this class one elastic with um, with a um, uh, buckle shelf screw, but so far the case is going well. The patient doesn't want to have any 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 more screw. Why rubber bands instead of power chains? Because we are we can use we could use power chains. Well, the reason why is that we don't see our patients, our um, Invisalign patients, that often. So as often as we see braces patients, for example. So uh, power chain, which is great too quickly, as it was mentioned by Dr. Dennis in 1985. Okay, even if we have better elastomers, uh, maybe it's not gonna degrade that quickly, but still, it's not gonna last three months. 
I see that pretty much we all see our patient our invisible patients every two three months. So first of, first reason they degrade too quickly. Second reason, even if you have a screw, even a, even if you have a button or class one or elastic that you would like to use with a power chain, patient can't replace um, power chain that easy. They are much better with rubber bands. I can show you here. So we see our patients every three months. Patients can manage perfectly their appointments and the force is gonna be constant because they're gonna change their um, their appointments four, three, four times a day. So that's why always use rubber bands, never use power chain. Another way to use uh, pads with the liners is to intrude a group of people. Uh, this kind of intrusion, this kind of uh, mechanics uh, responds pretty much the same way as you would be doing with braces, but you need to still need to think about it, everything up front. Because as I mentioned, it's an indirect, um, it's an indirect technique, so everything needs to be thought up front. Example. Lady with no lower, I think it was five and six, <clears throat> extrusion of the first quadrant, we want to intrude that. I'm sorry again, I was working the same for the same corporate. Not nice um, mirrors. This is the full case. We have a bit of crowding, top and bottom, uh, shapes a bit, uh, art shapes a bit narrow course, lateral torque problem, and the patients want to align their teeth and wants to have lower right five and six. So what do we do? Of course, at this point. This is the SAF, the lateral, the lateral SAF and uh, the OPG. This is the, you can see here, the reason why I put this slide is because I put the millimeter chart, and you can see that for especially the five, and also the six, are extruded. Okay, look, compare them to uh, the mesial cusp of the upper seven and to the distal cusp and to the cusp of the upper uh, tree. Okay, you can see that those teeth, the teeth in between are extruded. Okay, so crowns made by the, uh, the, the prosthodontist are not going to be nice. What do we do next? We think, we analyze the situation, we can see we have an uh, inverted anatomy, architecture. When we decide to intrude, again, um, clean check is a system of force, it's not the final result. So we overcorrect our intrusion in order to have a perfectly flat curve of span. What do I use, how do I do it? Well. I put two mini screws. Uh, the screw in the buckle, it's a, a, it's a Chris Chang screw and a screw in the palatal. Uh, I think it's a conventional screw. I don't remember the, the brand. But the principle is you put those screws outside of the alveolar bone. And for 24 hours a day, every time the patient has, 22 hours a day, so every time the patient has uh, the aligners on, uh, you just need to, like, for example, uh, 516 or one for um, rubber bands. Constant intrusion, constant intrusion, okay? This is the only way we can pull up this first one. Let's see if we have, if we have a video here. Oh, before this, we have lateral control. This is also important because we cannot just intrude these teeth if their axes are wrong. We first need to give them a correct Access and then we can pull them off. This is the video, this is very important. First, we reshape the arch. Second, we create a tiny gap that is not really visible here, but a tiny gap uh, between uh, mesial and this, me, distal to upper tree and mesial to tree. We can create a tiny gap, maybe 0 0.2 millimeters distal to three and mesial to seven. Because teeth need space to move, teeth need space to intrude, okay? 
then we don't move the two T's where we are applying the force. I mean upper seven and upper three. Those are the two pillars that are going to stay stable because with our mini screws and with the force of the aligners, we want to pull up those three T's, six, five, and four. Then we overcorrected a bit, and here on this view, we first, as you see, we're not intruding, but first we're trying to reshape the arch, correct the buckle and the crown and the root torque, and then we intrude. This is the reason why I decided to use, uh, let me say, I decided to use those attachments, okay? Theoretically, we wouldn't need those kind of attachments to intrude to you because plastic, as you might know, is super efficient as intruding it. But what we really want to know is to control the buckle flare. So again, very clear concept. But we go back again. First, reshape the arch. Second of all, create tiny gaps, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters, this to three, this to seven. This gap, these gaps need to be uh, in place until the all the movement is done, all the movement are done. Okay. Um, you can true teeth always correct. Maybe you can overcorrect in order to avoid the buckle fairing. The vertical movement must must be overcorrected because you're going to have a bit of relapse. Okay. Once the movements are done, you can finally, finally, finally close the gap. Okay. And um, and but and let close the gap. And well, of course, you need to have a support with the four quadrant. Might be maybe a Invisalign with uh, with Sempantec uh, or maybe already with implants. Okay. How fast does it go? Well, as fast as it would go with braces, okay, you don't have, you, you know, that might be <clears throat> maybe 0 0.8 millimeters every month, but nobody really knows how fast this case might go. Um, what kind of rubber bands might we use? Usually we use heavy or medium 516 1.4. To be comfortable but still a bit effective. Okay, do we tell the technician that we use that we're going to use mini screws? Well, it's not really useful for him, it just it's more useful for us because once we tell him, and the it's you know, like the dear technician that uses pads to intrude like six, five, and four means that he's going to do everything to intrude the through. So even if we forget that we're going to be placing. Uh, the, the, the mini screws during the review, that clean check, the technician's going to say, yes, dear doctor, I did this as you asked. So it's more as a reminder because on the clean check, we do not see that we're going to be putting the mini screws. So it's also helpful for us. How did it go? Let's see. This is the final case. As you can see, we have uh, perfect class one, bilateral class one over jet. It's perfect. We have center midline. Uh, the right, the first quadrant is perfectly leveled. We have a natural curvous bay. We have light anterior contact. And this was only because we managed to tweak and to manage our, uh, our final setup and the system of force. You can see space of this lady. Look at the difference in torque. I think you might see in the first quadrant. Look how, how we can already see the, um, we could already see the, uh, how the roots were outside and crowns were inside. While at the end of the right picture, you can see that their torque is perfectly straight. Okay? So this is very important because if you, if you wanted to start intrusion with the case from the, at the very beginning, you would your roots would have hit the cortical bone and you would have gone nowhere. So first of all, reshape, change the shape of your of your um, of your arch, and then 
influence with uh, the tweaks that they gave. Okay. Here. This is the finished case, right and left. You can see the torque and size of uh, torque is correct. And the smile line is correct, the display is correct. Thank you again for being with me. This was a module on my course that we'll be giving at the uh, online at the end of this uh, of this um, of this year. I hope you enjoyed. It was would have been very long to go through every single case, but I hope uh, you're still gonna take home some uh, some some important message. So now I'm gonna go through the. Um, I'm going to go through the, um, some questions that you uh, that you um, that you asked me, and then I think we will be ready to wrap up. Please do not hesitate to contact me by email or on my uh, Instagram. Okay, let me see what you just wrote. All right then. So. Uh, okay. Well, the question is, uh, uh, would you consider creating a hook on the parallel sides of the aligner and use the rubber bands? Uh, yes, and I'm going to read it. Would you consider creating a hook on the parallel sides of the aligner and use the rubber band for the prosthetic screw to that hook? Look, since the teeth needed intrusion on buckle movement, I guess it was the last phase. It's a good point. I wouldn't create a hook because on the hook you're gonna put your rubber band, your rubber band is gonna bend the plastic and you're gonna lose the fitting of your aligner. Okay. Uh, you're gonna have a buckle flaring, which is what we wanted, but it's not gonna be as controlled as having a good, slow, staggered movement, and um, it's going to be maybe quick, and then you will have, you will still have to put another screw to intrude, thousand screw to intrude the um, all the six, five, and four. Okay, so it might be a good idea on some cases. I would rather use a button cutout, but I wouldn't be using um, a hook. Let's see what we have last. Uh, the IPR. I've seen that many people wanted to ask uh, the IPR. So uh, the fact is, when you, when we use the uh, overcorrection aligners, you know the three overcorrection aligners that we have um, with Invisalign. Uh, actually, they slam the front teeth backward. Okay, they slam them back. Um, I don't know if you ever tried to, when, once you have a nice case, well aligned, and you wanted to close all those remaining space, and you use those, uh, those last three aligners, you lose your torque, you lose uh, your rotations, okay, and you might end up having more, uh, maybe even a, a crowding, overlapping of, of teeth. So. This is the reason why when you need to close a space, you can ask for a virtual power chain of seven to seven at the end of every case. But if you still have big gaps, what you can do is actually uh, asking for 0 0.2 millimeters of IPR and then, um, and then keeping the torque of the front teeth, because this is the back, the other thing that you need to keep in mind and closing on the space. You do for example, you need to do it maybe at the end of the movement when you, when your case is almost finished, because if you do it at the very beginning, those gaps around your teeth might be also useful to move your teeth. Don't forget the plastic needs to wrap around every single tooth to be more effective. Let's see, we have a last question. Um, um, does it change, does the biomechanics change if you put elastics on the aligner? 
uh, instead of the tooth for space closing? Well, this is, um, I don't think there's a real answer for this. I, I've seen many colleagues using um, the cuts so on the liner. So when you just hook up the, um, the rubber bands onto the liner, uh, let's say for class two elastics without extraction spaces, it's still it's still fine. Okay, I've seen I've seen uh, Malagon, I've seen uh, Pedro Herrero using them. It might work. It worked. Uh, there are amazing practitioners that would it work. But when when you really need to have uh, the stepping movement with the root, okay, you need to close this extraction space. Um, you cannot use a cut because the cut will uh, bend outward, okay? You're gonna squeeze the plastic, and even if you have an attachment, you're not gonna have the right control. And the last thing we want is uh, that after four or five aligners, we, uh, we are out of control. Um, the, I wanted to really thank you for being here today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Again, do not hesitate to contact me on every single, uh, you can contact me on Instagram, you can find me on Facebook, on my Gmail account. I will be more than happy to, I uh, will do my best to reply uh, to all of you. And thank you again. I hope you uh, brought home something nice. And thank you again for being here today.